So my name is Bertrand Losso. I am a senior scientist at uh, uh, the Philab, which is part of uh, ESRIN. ESRIN is uh, the Earth Observation Center of uh, the European Space Agency. We are located in Frascati, uh, near Rome, in Italy. Um, basically, we have. Um, so I wanted to, to give you a few words about who we are and what we are doing. Uh, and uh, indeed, the, the Philab is something that is very special, that is even unique uh, at, uh, yeah, we, within ESA, because we we have a very, very specific mission that is to, to accelerate the future of Earth observation by yeah. looking all over us about uh, new technologies, new digital technologies, which have the power to transform uh, the, the Earth observation. And uh, this goes from discovering proof of concept, blue sky ideas, so something that is uh, just uh, maybe mind blowing, but uh, not, uh, not proven uh, for the moment, <coughs> to, to help these ideas to, um, to grow, to to, to become more solid, and even uh, then to to start uh, to help companies to start business uh, with these uh, transformative technologies, and this uh, in order to to have a, a, a living uh, ecosystem, business ecosystem in Europe mostly, uh, for around Earth observation and more generally around space. For doing that, uh, the Philab is uh, divided in uh, two offices, the Explore Office and the Invest Office. Uh, a small word about, um, a short word about the Invest Office, which is, as you understood, the in charge of the second part of the process, so helping companies to grow and to, to develop uh, ideas. Uh, they are in particular, in particular, in charge of uh, a program we have in Europe uh, that is called the Incubed program. And with this program, uh, lots of companies, uh, startups mostly, uh, can go uh, to de-risking and, uh, and can get help to, uh, to develop uh, MVP, a uh, 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 minimum viable product, and then, I mean, enable them to, to, to go to the market. And of course, I mean, we are also confronting them. Uh, this is what invest uh, means. Uh, so it means we are taking the risk, we are helping them, and uh, we, we nurture this uh, new kind of ideas on, the, on products. Uh, on the other hand, we have also the Explore Office. And this is actually the, the team I'm belonging to, and also all the, the research fellows uh, who will speak after me. Uh, the Explore Office is perhaps more inclined to, to discovery, to, to emerging stuff. Uh, we are keeping our eyes wide open in order to, to catch uh, all the new ideas uh, in the digital world. Uh, and basically, what we want is really explore uh, what is new and what has the power to transform. When I talk about digital technologies, this is, of course, very large. Here you have a few examples. Uh, AI, of course, is uh, artificial intelligence, is uh, definitely the, the epitome of uh, a transformative technology because it has uh, transformed everything maybe uh, in the last 10 years. But uh, it's not the, the only one, actually. Uh, digital twins, for instance, which uh, have the, the capacity to replicate and simulate uh, something like a, an airplane, a building, a city, or maybe even the Earth, uh, are uh, this kind, I mean, are belonging to this uh, big family of transformative technology, along with virtual reality, quantum computing, blockchain, Internet of Things. So, Many, uh, as I said, we are keeping our eyes open in order to 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 see uh, everything uh, that, that could happen. And 
we are basically trying to to explore this idea by doing active research but also by building the ecosystem connecting people and also allowing people to by delivering data uh, helping them to build data sets so to set up new benchmarks and this is uh, um, by this uh, continuous uh, circle between use cases, outreach, and capacity building, that we, we enable uh, the community, the earth, observation, the earth observation community, to become uh, stronger and stronger. This, I guess you all know what it is. Uh, I, I love this image because it reminds us uh, that whatever I have said before about new technologies, what matters to us is this little blue planet, and I, I hope this is the same for you. And uh, of course, this is uh, the place we are living. There is likely no uh, planet B where we could live, so we have to take care of this little blue planet. And this is why uh, why we, we try to, to leverage all the, the means which are available today. And this means, basically, when I'm talking about our observation, this is this plethora, plethora of, um, of satellites which are now taking the pulse of our planet. Uh, they are everything, like the ones that uh, everyone knows, the uh, meteorological uh, satellites, uh, the satellites that are able to, to take images of, uh, of the planet. This one, you, everyone knows them also, thanks to, to, to Google Maps, for instance, on the Google Earth. Uh, but there are also more dedicated satellites dedicated to measure the, the quality of the air, the, the level of the oceans, uh, lots of stuff. Actually, by gathering all this information, we are maybe able to, to monitor the, the health of our planet. Of course, this uh, data avalanche has also, uh, I mean, is also raising some, some issues. Uh, how to extract the information. And here, actually, the, the AI, the artificial intelligence, uh, has reopened uh, a new dimension because it allows to, to retrieve the information, to detect uh, the stuff that matters in all this, uh, this data, this observation data. Um, and it goes for, for, for many things, uh, on combining many things from data science, um, image processing, computer vision for detection, classification, just also analy uh, analysis of uh, big data, uh, image processing through image enhancement, for instance, super resolution. And uh, maybe the, the next frontier is to bring all this capacity on board the satellites. So we are able to have smart satellites which are able to already to process the data and to, to extract the, the information on board. Um, uh, I do not forget that I'm talking today in a summer school dedicated to, uh, to, to supercomputing to, um, and, uh, and computing in general. And indeed, uh, all this uh, AI, uh, which goes from sensing to knowing, so, so really the, the problem here at ANS is uh, to, to extract information and to, to to help people to become smarter about our planet, all this um, this pipeline that is enabled by AI is also enabled by the hardware on which the AI is running. And here we are also investigating uh, lots of uh, various uh, compute means. Uh, of course, since there are lots of image processing, the GPUs, the clusters of GPUs maybe even in the cloud, are uh, a weapon of choice to, to process uh, the information. But uh, for instance, for running the, the big emulation models uh, of Earth sciences, which are so important to, to, to understand the climate and the climate change, uh, we need supercomputers. Uh, and Amer from uh, the Jewish supercomputer will give you an overview of this later. We are also investigating, as I said, edge computing, that is computing that is really small, really energy efficient, but uh, on which can be put directly on satellites on new stuff like neuromorphic computing, quantum computing. And actually, quantum computing is maybe the, 
uh, also uh, frontiers. So this is not for today, not for tomorrow, but maybe in 10, 15 years from now, this will be the, the type of, com of, uh, of computing that will allow us to run in uh, an energy efficient manner all the, all the process we want to achieve. Uh, something that uh, is really uh, driving us to, to implement all the solution is uh, a European initiative from the European Commission. It's called the Destination Earth Initiative. And basically, here, uh, this, um, this big project I mean, over several years, uh, more than 10 years, is to, be, uh, to build uh, a replica of, uh, of the Earth, a digital replica, digital Earth twin, um, that will put together everything that we know uh, about, about our planet, from uh, models, physical models of uh, the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, everything, global warming, the observation from the satellites, and by combining everything also with AI, uh, we will be able to to do uh, to make some prediction, to to infer what will happen next, and to play what is very important for the decision maker, uh, to play what if scenarios. What happens if, for instance, the temperature is rising by one degree? What is the consequence on the sea level, on the the glaciers? Uh, and also, I guess that Crystal later will give you a, a hint about that. As I said before, the next uh, frontier uh, is definitely space, and uh, a way to achieve this is by edge computing. Uh, Gabriele will explain you what we do uh, to build the, a cognitive cloud in space by bringing uh, computing directly in the satellites, and maybe by, by building this kind of network of computers, so a cloud, really a computer cloud directly in space, to just distribute the, the compute resources where they, they need to be. It's time for me to, to leave the floor to, to my brilliant colleagues. Uh, we have a website. I uh, invite you to, to follow us, to, to keep us, uh, to, to, to keep in touch uh, with us, with, with uh, what we are doing. Uh, please be aware also that we have uh, some job openings. And also, we are, more than that, very open to collaboration. So I know today we're in South America, a bit far from Europe, but maybe there is a possibility through uh, a joint project with a European university that you come to visit us. So if you are a PhD student, a postdoc, uh, even a more experienced researcher, just get in touch and maybe we find a, a way to, to collaborate. And we'll be very happy about that. Thank you. So I will now um, share the slide from my colleagues. Okay, and the, the first speaker is uh, Raquel Kahn. Okay, let me see if this is not loading for me, I'm not sure. Can you already see something? Because uh, it's like a black screen for me. I cannot see anything. We also don't see anything. Okay, okay. maybe. It's okay. Maybe now. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rekha Karam. I'm a Portuguese national trainee working at the FILAP. And I will present our project on AI to understand dengue, which is in collaboration with UNICEF. They actually, uh, their team brought up the need of a tool to provide insight on how climate change has been impacting the transmission of dengue 
in South American countries, and this eventually led to uh, into a, a structured goal of building a predictive model able to forecast dengue incidence rate one month ahead uh, for the states of Brazil. Um, so in the first stage, we collected uh, data from different sources for a period of 20 years. This data included uh, reports on dengue uh, cases, demographic data, earth observation satellite products, uh, climate reanalysis models, social economical variables and geospatial features. Uh, and here you can see uh, some of the uh, plots that we did initially to have, have a sense of how dengue was uh, distributed across uh, the different states of Brazil. So we have the dengue incidence rate, maximum temperature, NDVI elevation, humidity, precipitation, and so on. Um, we then uh, merged the data together, uh, performed initial uh, exploratory analysis, data cleaning, feature engineering, data normalization, and dimensionality reduction. Um, within um, within feature engineering, uh, I can highlight the computation of oh, this is okay. I can highlight the computation of uh, other climate variables based on the ones already present, like the the relative humidity was was computed uh, afterwards, and also the aggregation of the daily meteorological variables into monthly averages weighted by population. In this way, we we could give more weight to the variables in more uh, heavily populated states. Uh, we then fed the data uh, to an ensemble of machine learning models composed of uh, categorical boosting, uh, the support vector machine, and a long short-term memory um, model, an LSTM uh, model. Uh, we fused the results of each uh, machine learning model uh, by imputing their outputs to a random forest. Um, and to evaluate their performance, um, we compared it against the standard statistical model, which was uh, spatial temporal Bayesian um, hierarchical mixed models. And we used uh, the root mean square error, error as a metric. Um, the, the the train and test data uh, must be split in such a way as to respect the temporal ordering uh, since uh, the instances are chrono uh, chronologically connected. Therefore, the data set was divided into training and validation um, by selecting data from 2001 to 2016 as the training and from 2016 to uh, 2019 for the validation. And also the data set was uh, reshaped in order to create short time series by applying a moving window of one year. Um, the plot that uh, I show here displays a typical situation that was observed while um, comparing the hour ensemble model and the baseline results uh, on forecasting uh, the dengue incidence rates for the total population and also for uh, the 0 19 age group. Um, here, the, the dashed vertical line divides the, divide, divides the left graph uh, into two parts, the training and the validation. Then you have a zoom on the validation period on the right part. Um, the, uh, the plot shows the observed cases as the ground truth uh, in, in yellow. Uh, then you have the results of the ensemble model in red and the results on the baseline of the baseline model in green. We can see that both models follow the seasonality signal and the peaks of the epidemics. Uh, however, the ensemble model is more accurate and the baseline tends to either anticipate or overestimate the observed peaks of incidence. In contrast, the, the ensemble model remains more faithful to the ground truth and is more confident on the predictions. Um, we not only uh, obtained really good results, but we also were able to successfully transfer the knowledge learned to another South American country, which was Peru. Uh, the final deliverable of this project to UNICEF will be uh, what we call um, a cookbook that uh, is basically um, a guidebook that will help them to fully reproduce our framework. And recently, IRCAI, uh, which is the International Research Institute on AI of UNESCO, 
recognized our joint research on forecasting dengue outbreaks as part of the 2021 Global Top 100 list of AI solutions for sustainable development. And I will stop here. Thank you. All right. Should I start? Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes, please. You just tell me tell me next slides to when it's time yeah. to move. Yeah. I should have made a, a presentation with with less slides. I'm sorry. We're gonna have to do that. <laughs> so, um, hello. My, my name is Christa Chapuis, and I'm a PhD student at EPFL uh, with the support of the Philab. So uh, I will talk about the topic of uh, interacting with remote sensing images using uh, natural language. So yeah, good. Um, so in this task, we have uh, an image and we have questions. Uh, they are simple, but they are different. And the goal is to have a, a single model uh, able to answer these different questions. Uh, one of the core principles of the, of the task is to enable a simple interaction between the image and the user. And that would allow non-technical people to directly benefit from uh, the very large quantity of, of, of Earth observation data that is being continuously recorded. Thank you. So uh, we have on the top an image and we have a question that we have about this image and we would like to predict an answer. We will see in the next slide how we can do it. So in the first model that was proposed uh, by Lobri and colleagues, we had a uh, two feature extractor. We had the ResNet for the image and we had a skip thought recurrent neural network for the question. Then both high level features uh, are combined in the fusion step and uh, the output is classified into uh, the, the space of the possible answers. Uh, we can go to the next slide, thank you. And uh, in the first experiments I conducted when I, I started my PhD, I compared the, the different strategies uh, that were available for, for fusing these uh, high level features. So uh, I compared two, uh, three different uh, approaches with different level of complexities. Next slide, please. Uh, then in my second set of experiments, I started to focus more on the language part of the of the model. I compared the, the recurrent neural network that was uh, in place in the baseline with different, uh, more um, uh, uh, with different strategies, uh, and in particular transformer models uh, that use attention uh, mechanisms um, and. Uh, um, and I looked into in, into the the, strategy, the sorry the model of uh, Bert. We can go to the next slide. Um, in my last work that uh, I presented last week in the Earth Vision workshop at the com uh, at the Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference, I tried to translate the image into words. Um, so um, I uh, I. I, I, I then fed the, the question along with this uh, with this visual context that was prompted to uh, the language model uh, to um, to help guide the language model to the answer. We can go to the next slide. Um, data set used to conduct these experiments are presented uh, in this slide. I'm sorry. Can you click again? Maybe I put that in animation. Now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so basically, I used the ISVQA series of uh, data sets. We have a low and a high resolution data set, and we also have the ISVQA BigOSNet data set. All of these data sets are freely available. Um, you can look them up on the link I put or with the QR code. And uh, there are a few uh, data sets that uh, I should mention, such as FloodNet that is concerned with flooding events, RSI VQA, uh, and change detection VQA. We can go to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so training all of these models uh, can be quite costly, uh, especially for the case of the high resolution and the RSVQA mid-biggest net um, experiments. 
it took about a, a week to produce the results. Um, but across the different models and data sets we have, we reach a total um, accuracy between 75 and 85 percent. So it's already quite good, but each uh, additional percentage is not so easy to get. Um, although the answers are not always correct, we can see that the models uh, can choose the right type of answer. So if I'm asking a question about, uh, so a counting question, how many of something, then the, the model will give me a numerical answer. Uh, here we have some examples, so some are success, uh, like we see on the on the left, and in the middle it's actually not that easy easy to uh, identify the the religious place. You have to look at the bottom right side of the image to see the little uh, golden dome. Uh, but on the right side of the screen, you can see that the model still completely fails at a very obvious situation for us. So in my experiments, I've seen that usually more complex interaction help uh, predict better answers. And while an interesting avenue is to leverage the very large language model of or the vision and language model that have been uh, very recently uh, produced, um, I believe that it's also very important to go uh, for a more interpretable method for humans to, to use and to actually trust uh, this tool. Mm, on the data side, uh, we I believe that there's a need for more elaborate and realistic questions uh, that are be, that would be closer to an actual human's need. And um, uh, to conclude, so my work concentrates on creating a simple interaction using natural language. Today, I'm trying to extract information from remote sensing images. But uh, as Bertrand mentioned, you can imagine future applications such as interacting with uh, digital twins of the Earth uh, to run what-if scenarios uh, or run potential environmental uh, situation uh, to better understand the, the Earth and what uh, climate change or other situation could uh, um, make of the Earth. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is my uh, supervision team with Bertrand, uh, you can see on the, on the right. Okay, can you hear me? So my name is Gabriele Meoni, and I am a research fellow in the Philab, and together with um, some colleagues and Darius Builder from University of Sapienza, we are now focusing on the end-to-end uh, -end processing uh, of uh, multispectral classification data on board satellites. But before going to the details of the project, I just want to give you an idea of what it means and why there might be a need for edge computing and so processing. Uh, on board. So to understand that, we can focus on the so-called classical or bent pipe approach that uh, traditionally use uh, uh, so far. So according to the, to the classical approach, satellite is basically just a sensor with minimal computation performed on board, and satellite just collect data. And when coming to the proximity of the ground station, in a range of few minutes, depending on the visibility, they can download the data despite of the quality of their content and then the data are processed and uh, adjusted just remove the noise and so on. They are distributed uh, from the ground segment uh, to the scientists or the stakeholders or whatever they use them. This approach is um, the classical one, but maybe not the best in terms of scalability. Depending, for instance, if you need to have uh, actionable information, maybe a alert or anything that you can want to exploit on board, you cannot actually use that because the data are actually processed on the ground. So what actually you can do uh, by uh, deploying artificial intelligence on board is destruction of actionable information that you can deliver, for instance, by using different technology, maybe in the future mobile technology, but at the moment also not um, different bands. They don't require to have a proper gun station, maybe a simple antenna on a car. For instance, what you can send is an alert when we have a, a fire or something like that. So you can actually deliver this kind of uh, data and, and the plus inf actionable information directly to the end user. And to concretely understand what this kind of uh, actionable information might be, um, you can focus on the case, for instance, of uh, 
uh, disasters when you want to perform an early warning. So according to the classical approach, you need to wait the satellites to be closer to the ground station, process the information, uh, uh, deliver to the one as to, to the end user that has to search for a fire or for a disaster, and then you have the alert. If you perform the, the detection of the disasters or even the forecasting on board, you can deliver immediately the early warning. This might be done, for instance, for volcanic eruption that I will present, or for instance, one particular case is also what happens in the ocean. For instance, most of the satellites at the moment, for instance, Sentinel is not acquiring because of the of the bandwidth issue. So they need to save uh, bands to they need to save they need to reduce the amount of images. But if you can process and deliver only the information, you might alert, for instance, the coverage also to the oceans. And for instance, you can uh, spot oil spills. So this approach. Uh, is actually faster, safer, and scale more scalable. Faster for them because you don't need to wait to be closer to the ground station. Safer because, for instance, if you have a, a fire and the, the ground station is closer to the fire, you might not receive the data on the other. Scalable because you cannot put ground station everywhere if the data will increase in the future. But of course, uh, moving artificial intelligence on board uh, requires to face some problems. And one of them is the fact that uh, satellites have limited comp uh, computational power. This is the fact that usually, especially if you have a small satellites, so you have a limited energy that you can uh, use on board. And uh, there's not energy that is devoted only if you port artificial intelligence only to the to the processing, but you need also to pro to the sorry to the acquisition, but you need also to do the processing on board. And because of that, uh, energy efficiency is a key. And when you have a small cube set, so satellites that uh, might weigh some kilos or something like that, in that case, the power budget may be a few watts to do everything. So you can understand that when you have data on board, uh, when you have data on the ground, the, usually the data that you use for processing and to use artificial intelligence are already pre-processed. For instance, if you have a multispectral systems when the bands are when you have only RGB, but you have more uh, actually colors and not only visible colors, but also spectral information or, or outside the visible. Uh, usually you need to co-register the man and to do some kind of a processing that performing that on board requires a lot of time and power. And this is a problem because the power and the energy budget that you have on board affects the number of images that you can acquire and process. So one of the questions for which we want to move to the end to end, so from the sensor to the acquisition of the actionable information is, can 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 read, get rid of for some of the preprocessing steps, and usually to detect fires you don't need AI. But when we have to face with very raw data that may be no band score registration, may be really deg degraded in terms of uh, quality, can deep neural network cannot perform the standard deterministic approach? That's the research question of our project. So the methodology we're focusing on the volcano classification. Is, is the following. We Since there's no L0, so the raw data available, because so far they've been not considered the product, uh, what we want to do is uh, emulation, uh, do performing an emulation of this kind of data set. So we want to, to add some geometric effects and radiometric effects to distort the, uh, the images. And then what we are planning, so we are actually doing it, is performing uh, the classification of the eruption, both using standard approaches and artificial intelligence approaches just to see actually if AI can, can in this case outperform the other approach, the other st standard approach, and also um, provide a, a better accuracy when there's no preprocessing. So at the moment uh, we have no uh, complete results, we have just preliminary results, but just to mention, by using one of the deterministic approaches to spot an eruption, by using the, the paper cited here, you just take the first two steps of the of the uh, basically of the algorithm they propose that propose basically to create a not map over the pixel there might be an eruption that to to use nine pixel clustering and if nine pixel are at all at uh, considered an eruption then you consider this uh, as the entire image as uh, as an eruption for classification that's the way we do you see that if you um, perform on an original image with no bands uh, with, with completely co-registration effects uh, the the basically the Pixel level classification is quite good, but as soon as you add some uh, of uh, distortion effects like the one you might have on board, uh, you have a lot of false positive. Then they might reflect in total to a lot of uh, images that are classified as an eruption or not by using standard deterministic approaches. Of course, these uh, results are just preliminary, but in the end, we want to try to see actually if we can use AI to process end to end. So very close to this answer. And 
Now I want to present another project that is still investigating the energy efficiency of the processing, but not uh, of digital networks, but we want to use in, a, in a, another computing paradigm is the so-called neuromorphic computing. And we started this investigation when we want to understand what are the possible advantages and disadvantages of digital networks. Of course, uh, deep neural networks are really scalable in the sense that the training algorithms make them the state of the art of different computer vision and natural language processing, but they are really uh, computational intensive. Indeed, the power consumption required and the computational resources in general to, for deep learning double every three dot four months. So they might be not the best in terms of energy efficiency. And also, they are not really biological plausible in the sense that there is no backpropagation in biological brains. So to be by being inspired from, uh, um, I can say, human brains, we decide to use a, a different approach or actually to investigate a different approach, the so-called spiking neural networks. So spiking neural networks are um, as deep neural networks, pretty old models, but we, at the moment they are not um, they have not used so broad the usage. Uh, to understand how the spike in neural networks work and why they might be uh, interesting in terms of energy efficiency, you can take a look at the graph here, where you have three neurons A, B, and C. So uh, neuron A and uh, B uh, fire a spikes. That's why they're called spiking, because they actually emit a spike over the time. And neuron C, every time you receive a spike as input, uh, increases internal voltage, is basically an internal variable, until it passes a, a certain threshold called VTH. When the voltage passes the threshold, the voltage is reset and the spike is emitted. So as you can see, this kind of computing paradigm is really similar to the way our brain works. You know, it's com completely parallel and asynchronous. And when used on dedicated hardware, so-called neuromorphic hardware, it's usually, uh, usually really energy efficient. The problem is, compared to deep neural networks, they are not really scalable in terms of uh, how many layers you can um, you can actually your uh, your model have. It is due to the fact that the 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 maturity of the algorithm is not at that level anymore. So when you have to process uh, earth observation data like the one you you can see here, this may pose a limit because the feature that you usually have to pr to process are quite complex. So you need to have pretty deep models. So we try to investigate uh, on uh, land use, land cover classification application for which we have a lot of uh, benchmark data set uh, and compare spiking neural networks and artificial neural network in terms of energy efficiency. So uh, the methodology we have used is pretty straightforward. We used um, one approach called rate-based neural networks uh, where actually you exploit the similarity, mathematical similarity between the activation function of artificial neural networks and the firing rate of spiking neural networks. And after training an artificial neural network, we use VGG16 because it's pretty easy to convert. Then what you actually do, you can retrain using the same weights and retrain in the, in the spiking models just to fine tune the model. In terms of uh, results, we have at the moment um, uh, actually uh, an accuracy drop up to 7%. But if you compare the energy on a standard GPU and the energy on the Lohi processor, a typical Intel neuromorphic processor, one of the um, uh, most used at the moment, what actually you can see is basically the you we got 34 times increase in terms of energy efficiency. These results are actually preliminary. We didn't really do the inference, but use proxies. So uh, in the future research, we are planning and we are actually doing trying to infer models on the hardware and to have more hardware proof results. But if you're interested, you can try our code. So thank you very much for your attention. Next speaker will be Hamer Delil Bazic from Russian Trun Zurich. Yes, hello. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> My name is Abedil Padic. I am a doctoral researcher uh, at the Jurich Supercomputing Center in Germany. I'm a PhD student at the University of Iceland. And with the Philab, I am um, I'm working on a, on a project which uh, is aimed at uh, building uh, algorithms which are hybrid and use both uh, uh, quantum and classical resources for uh, solving some problems in uh, uh, in Earth observation, which require 
uh, large scale uh, computing power. Uh, today, I, my presentation will be divided in two parts. I will um, first uh, describe uh, the role of HPC in this project, and, and then we'll talk a little bit more in detail about quantum computing and how we can integrate it to our workflows. Um, thank you. Um, so, uh, we know what uh, HPC is. Basically, high-performance computing is uh, just a broad term where uh, we we um, describe uh, all the, the computing architectures which are able to perform uh, calculations uh, like in a very fast way. Um, supercomputers are uh, like the, the main purpose of is to build uh, a network of computers with a high um, high speed network infrastructure, and, um, and this network infrastructure sh uh, should uh, enable the, the fast communication between all the nodes of our supercomputer, and thus um, enabling a, a high high speed uh, computing uh, power. Um, so I mean, the main uh, application of uh, this project is ad addressing um, data, data intensive uh, applications in uh, remote sensing and Earth observation. Because how how has been already mentioned, we uh, we are getting information from a very uh, different, broad, and high number of sources, and uh, all, uh, the data is uh, at, at a growing rate every year. And uh, we need to extract some information from the from the raw data we get from from our um, space uh, space uh, uh, and Earth observation sources. Um, this the, the role of this project is to enhance the computing power. So we we, sh we are trying to deal with this big data problem by uh, developing algorithms which can uh, process a high number uh, amount of data in uh, a lower amount of time. Um, we in Yurish we have this. Um, we are working on this concept, which is the concept of modular supercomputer. What is a modular supercomputer? It's a design where all the, the modules are connected, and each module is more or less independent, has uh, its own logic and its own um, architecture and computing and uh, computing technology and is meant for a specific uh, purpose. So um, all these modules you see here, um, basically uh, different in the role they have. And they, uh, the, the key concept is that we have this integration as a, an, at a system level. So the end user just uh, works with the, this architecture, like from a strong system level. So it uh, makes use of some libraries and uh, High level applications and these applications are able to um, divide the task into modules in, a, in a, the best way according to the, to the requirements. So the end user doesn't really need to, to know like exactly how to program the single module, but this is done like at a higher level. Um, and of course, this is uh, enabled through a high performance network. This uh, right side, you see an image, an image of Uvels. This is our our more, like most performant um, uh, modular supercomputer in English. It's made of uh, basically of, uh, of two uh, modules: the cluster module, which is uh, made mostly of uh, Intel CPUs, and the booster module, which is mostly made of uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, the booster is more uh, designed for specific. Applications, for example, in uh, in deep learning. Um, so next slide. Okay, uh, what has been done so far um, in Zurich? We have uh, leveraged the, the power of race HPC in uh, uh, in remote sensing, and in particular on uh, the use case of land cover classification, which is also already been mentioned. It's very popular, but also a challenging problem. Um, we, I have showed just two uh, examples, two results. The first one, uh, the first row, is how is how we can uh, uh, how we can train a convolutional neural network by using GPUs in a scalable way. So um, we we showed that uh, we can we can 
uh, actually leverage the, the booster module and use uh, different nodes of the of the of the module and uh, use them in a way that if we increase the number of nodes we have uh, we can uh, obtain a substantial speed up by having the same number the same accuracy more or less it's, so we, we need both to have the same performance but do it in a, low, in a lower amount of time this, this is the main purpose of building scalable algorithms the second uh, application I want to mention and then <laughs> we don't have much time uh, it's uh, to um, tune this model so every every AI model has to be tuned and the tuning is crucial we need to do it properly as it can really decide how how performant it will be and uh, if we try, if we also speed up the, the tuning it, then we can also like speed up the whole the whole uh, learning um, and we have done this still with our, with us in the convolutional neural network and by performing a parallelization where uh, we perform a specific um, uh, uh, batch size change and we we schedule the all the steps of the of the hyperparameter tuning in the, in the HPC we can uh, again uh, get a speed up in the in the time per epoch and so in the total uh, hyperparameter tuning time uh, by getting uh, a, a consistent and a good amount of uh, for the value of the accuracy. Um, okay, so this is uh, what what concerns HPC. Those are some preliminary results. How uh, can we integrate quantum computing in, in all this? Uh, well, it's uh, it's quite easy because uh, we talked about the model supercomputer, and one of the key aspects of uh, of it is flexibility. So not only we we in, we are able to access it like from a system level, but uh, also if we want to add something from a like an, an infrastructural level, we can do it because it's like modular by definition. So we can add some um, advanced and, and disruptive computing technologies without really changing uh, the whole infrastructure, and we can do this uh, by integrating neuromorphic computing, for example, but also quantum computing and. Uh, this is the role of the, of the quantum module, um, which is represented by Unique. This is uh, an infrastructure um, where we can access different uh, computing modules um, in the quantum world with different levels of maturity and different purposes from a, a unified portal. And um, the purpose is the same. Uh, we need to increase the computational power. In this case, it's much more diff different because those are ve like very new disruptive technologies. We don't really know what is their their capability. We don't really know, like in advance, what are what would be the the advantages and limitations for each module. So uh, it's it's still a matter of research to understand how we can really integrate all this uh, this computing um, computing um, nodes to the to the to, to a a, bro, a, more, a more complex HPC infrastructure. Uh, here on the right side, you can see a picture of uh, D-Wave Advantage, which is a quantum annealer, which is a specific type of quantum computer, which uses quantum annealing to perform some specific computational tasks. And this is the, the, the only, the only D-Wave quantum annealer we have in Europe, and it's located in, in Zurich, in the Zurich Supercomputing Center. Um, one of the purposes of this project is also to understand how we can really make use of it and get the most out of its, its uh, computational power. Um, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so um, the, fir the first part of, of my project was actually to understand how this machine works and how we can use it for um, AI, an AI application in, in Earth observation. I, I chose um, Lanco classification, and the main idea is this machine is limited. It's very powerful, but limited in what the, the type of tasks it can, it can uh, actually perform, which are basically um, some optimization problems where the, the variables are binary. And um, how can we translate this to AI? Well. Um, 
we have seen that, for example, the, the support vector machine algorithm, which has also already mentioned, uh, can be refrained as uh, an optimization problem, which can be uh, solved by the quantum annealer. It's not a perfect correspondence, but we have seen that we can get some good results. Actually, um, we have this uh, like this example where one of the results uh, on the right side is is the, the, the example of uh, classification map where the ground truth is on the left. We, um, it's a very uh, particular machine which can get some very good results. We've also got some results which are better than this, some which are worse. It's it's very particular machine. As I said, we, we still have to understand how how effective it can be. But so far, we've seen that it can actually uh, get some results which are comparable to, to classical computation, at least. And uh, so we think that it, it is a good uh, fit for our purposes, and we can really try to, to understand how we can uh, use the, the advantages of it in a, in a, in a bigger, a bigger um, framework. As I mentioned in the beginning, my purpose was is to build hybrid algorithms. So once we understand the single, the, the, the capabilities of the single modules and nodes of the of, of the HPC infrastructure, uh, it's the, the best idea, and it's something which has also been said by by also many co quantum computing companies is to merge and bring together the quantum and the classical world. We cannot really rely on quantum alone because it's very powerful, but it's limited. So I think that this is a good uh, starting point where we um, um, actually build algorithms which do some uh, subtasks on, on classical computers and subtasks on quantum computers, and together try to to um, to solve real problems. Um, thank you for your attention.